Good morning. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. We are preaching this morning on uh, Galatians 6, 11 to 18. Let me give a little introduction to the book. Um, this book is a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in the city of Galatia, a city in Greece, uh, probably in the 50s AD. Of all Paul's letters, this one is probably the sharpest, the most argumentative. Many people think it could have been the first of his letters when he was young and brash. Um, you can also tell something about the way it feels personal. It has autobiographical stories about Paul's life, his call by Christ, even a flash of conflict with Peter. Our passage today is from the very end of the book where Paul is wrapping things up. What I want to do, what I will try to do, is summarize the presenting issues, the core of his argument. And I'm going to try to do that in a way that is helpful and factual, but let me tell you what I don't want to do. I don't want to remove the passion from the argument. Galatians is a passionate book. Paul feels strongly about what he is saying. He believes it is vital, not only that we understand, but that we follow in his footsteps. You know, many arguments are trivial, like who makes the best pizza? Other arguments are important. I love you. You need to take this medicine or I'm afraid you might die. Galatians is the second kind of argument. Uh, that's my introduction. Um, here we go. Galatians uh, 6, uh, 12 through 18. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh and all that applies. May I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus on my body. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. End of the book. To me, the key word in this passage, or at least the one I'm going to come to it with, is the word boasting. The word boast, of course, means to speak or act in a way that shows excessive pride or self-satisfaction about one's achievements, possessions, or abilities. Sometimes boasting is cute, like the four-year-old who insists they can run faster than anyone in the world. Worthy is the 16 year old who boasts that they are an excellent driver and that speed limits need not apply to them. Then again, there is the person who boasts that they are smart and that they can learn absolutely anything without any help from anyone else. While this is theoretically true, I can assure you that if I tried this with the plumbing problems in my house, the results would not be good, nor the house dry, nor the wife happy. And some things are basically impossible for us. As I think, as I consider all the people who I think will be hearing this sermon, I can't think of any real athletes, and I definitely don't know any who do high jumping. Perhaps if we tried, some of us could make a high jump of two, three feet, maybe more. But no matter how many two to three foot jumps we make, I don't think anyone in my church sanctuary this morning is going to make the six, seven or more feet needed to win even basic competitions. And if any of you boast otherwise, I'm going to look at you askance and skeptically think to myself that you are crazy. So there are these people in the church of Galatia and they have a Jewish background. And they keep kosher, and they follow all the Jewish customs and laws, including getting circumcised. And here's what they say. Look, Jesus was a Jewish prophet, and if you want to follow Jesus, you should learn and follow the Jewish customs. You should do your best to be worthy of Jesus, and then Jesus will help you that extra step at the end. 
In other words, you jump as high as you can, and then Jesus will lift you over the seven-foot bar. In response to this, Paul says, no, no, no. (laughs) You have it completely wrong. You are implying that people should do something before coming to faith in Jesus, that they should try to be good on their own first and then come to Jesus as the last step. No, no, no. People try that. It will inevitably lead them to boast in their own efforts and imagine that they are being successful and then they may delude themselves that they are good enough through their efforts, and then they may never get around to coming to Jesus, which is what is essential. Here is what Paul said about such persons uh, back in Galatians 1.7, his concern about them. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Knows all about Jewish customs and laws. He is literally an expert. Um, his expertise completely led him astray until Jesus set him straight. Galatians 1 11 through 16. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any person, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Remember the book of Acts, Paul was arresting Christians? I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. And so Paul describes his own conversion, his turning toward Jesus who sought him out in the most dramatic fashion imaginable. Contrary to his opponents in Galatia, Paul insists that you don't waste time working on your own first. You go to Jesus first. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go to Jesus first. Then do whatever Jesus would have you do. How do you do that? How do you accept and access Jesus? Through faith. Faith like Abraham's. That is what Paul tells the Galatians in chapter 3, 6 through 7. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Abraham didn't try to improve his life on his own. When God invited him to upend his whole life, take his family and flocks and walk several hundred miles to a strange country and take up residence there, that is what Abraham did. He didn't suggest that God should wait while Abraham completed his self-help program or started training for the journey. He got his stuff together and he went at the spry age of 75. My friends, faith starts with God. And for we who live after the time of Jesus, it really starts with Jesus. When Jesus called to Paul, Paul upended his whole life, went AWOL from the anti-Christian patrol, went to Syria and started preaching the good news of Christ. Now here's a trick question. Am I telling you about Paul and Abraham so that you can be inspired by their stories and imitate them? It's a trick question because there is a little yes, but the real answer is no, no, and no. As someone preaching Galatians, I don't want you to imitate the actions of any human being, or at least I insist you cannot start there. However, I do want you to imitate their faith, to have faith like Paul's and like Abraham's. But don't waste your time trying to imitate their actions. Faith but not work works, my friends. Let me return to boasting and the central verse of our passage for today. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What is the one thing Paul will boast in? 
Interestingly, it is not Christ, at least that's not what he says in this verse. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why does he boast on the cross? Because the cross represents a breaking point, a separation between the ordinary mundane life in the world and new life in Christ. Jesus' earthly life ends, then he rises to new resurrection life. And that is the kind of invitation we are given. We are given the opportunity to break from our old life, the life where we have to get by by our own strength and our own intelligence and the sweat of our brow. However great or meager those gifts are, we can let all of that go. And this is a blessing because whether you are someone who can jump one foot high or five feet high, you will never make it to nine feet no matter how hard you work on it. And it will do you no good whatsoever to beat yourself up about what a bad high jumper you are, to feel rotten and helpless, sad and useless. So there you are, lying on the ground, weeping and wailing and feeling miserable when Jesus comes by, lifts you up, throws you 12 feet in the air, runs to the other side of the bar, catches you ever so gracefully, and sets you on your feet with a smile. Are you really going to act like a two-year-old, shove him away and say, I wanted to do it myself? That is what the people Paul was criticizing are like. They aren't looking at Jesus. They are a little scared of Jesus. They want to rely on their own capabilities. They don't really want to commit to Jesus. They want to keep their head down. They are miserable and half-hearted in their faith, and they try to get other people to approach things the same way they do. And that makes them kind of passive-aggressive. They're pointing the finger at other people and telling them they need to get circumcised and stop eating pork. And Paul is like, no, no, and no. <laughs> We're doing the same stuff today. How many areas of your life are there where your basic answer is, I just need to try harder. I ought to be able to do this. I haven't managed it for the last 30 years, but I'm going to get it this year. Um, I'm going to be strong. I've got a new organizational technique or a new diet or whatever. And all those things are fine. They, they might even work for a few goals in particular circumstances. But if your whole life is oriented around trying to be a good person, as if that were possible for any of us in this fallen world, Paul is trying to point you in a better direction. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Accept that any capacity we have for living a good and virtuous life does not arise from us. It is a gift that comes to us from above. Like Jesus on the cross, we break from our old ways and embrace this new life. We get off the treadmill, off the hamster wheel, which goes nowhere, and embrace the cross. You will have to figure out exactly what that means for you. Chances are well, that insight will come from being a regular member of a faith community. For most people, it never happens if you take Jesus or the cross or Christian faith casually. You will never accomplish it by looking inwardly toward yourself and your own life. You can only do it by looking at something outside yourself, something better, Jesus on the cross. Look at what you want to aspire toward. Don't waste time on what you are and your failings. My friends, the cross is a very radical thing. It is painful, but it is also a doorway. Don't try to stand in the doorway. In reality, you are either on one side or the other. Paul said, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to this second part, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Let me close with, of all things, a grammatical note about the word crucified. It is in the perfect tense, not the past tense. Even though the crucifixion happened 2,000 years ago, it still has ongoing effects today. 
Same with my birth, right? I was born in 1963, but my birth still has effects. I am alive in 2023. To echo Paul's language, the crucifixion means that in some way I have been crucified to the world and I somehow bear the mark of Christ. And I close with this beautiful verse, Galatians 2.20. Crucified is in the perfect tense there too. Here we go. I have been crucified with Christ and no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. May it be so, my friends. And we all come to realize this, the miracle of the cross and the invitation of Christ. God bless you all. Amen.